is Lord. Oh, from the bottom of my heart and to the depths of my soul, yes, Lord. Completely. your hands tonight and sing it to him. Oh, 
praise tonight. Hallelujah. He's worthy of our high praise. Oh, hallelujah. His goodness and His mercy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. Come on, let's praise Him a little bit more here tonight. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. worthy. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. He is worthy of our highest praise. Sometimes we don't feel like that praise isn't getting past the ceiling, but I promise you, if you call out His name and if you lift up praise and lift up worship... He receives it. He responds. He answers. And you invite him into this place and will feel the presence, the refreshing presence of God. That's why we're here tonight, midweek service. We need a refreshing. Amen? I don't know about you, but we need a refreshing. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to have the ushers come at this time. Amen, amen, amen. God is good. Please remember all of those that we have seen on the, uh, Brother Hay, um, that we have seen come across the prayer chain. Remember those in prayer. I know I did receive an update from Sister Strickland. Uh, from her daughter, and uh, Sister Strickland is being uh, transferred over to a rehabilitation center, praise God, so she can continue that healing process and recovery process. Um, So just continue to remember her in your prayers. Remember a week and a half from today, or not this weekend, but the following weekend at least, is going to be homecoming weekend. Amen. We do have a few things around the church that um, we need to get finished and wrapped up, some projects that we've started and we did not finish per se. So we need to make sure that uh, we get some participation with those items. If you have some available time, does not... uh, Uh, matter what time of day it is, you just let me know when you're available and I'll tell you what we have left to do and uh, we will work around your schedule. Praise God. Um, So just remember that. Also, uh, to make this really uh, magnificent, we need to have as much food as possible on that Saturday. Praise God. And uh, so if you're able to bring a dish, a side dish, uh, uh, cheesecake, um, and uh, stuff like that, um, please see uh, my wife and let her know what you can bring 
uh, what you're able to bring, and uh, we'll make sure that we uh, uh, just account for that and see what we have left, and, and then we'll make sure that regardless of what we're lacking, we, we will make sure that we have plenty for us to eat, fellowship, and have a good time. We're going to have games. We're going to have a lot of fun. And most importantly, the following day on Sunday, we're going to have some church. Amen. We're going to have some church. Praise the Lord. Young people, you can be dismissed. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm excited about tonight's lesson. And I know we're starting a little, a little earlier than what we typically do, um, but that does not mean that we'll get out a little earlier. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. No, we're going to have fun tonight. And I pray that you would um, uh, really just kind of be a, a tentative to tonight's lesson. I believe that it is essential. I believe this is what the Lord has laid on my heart, and I believe that um, or I know I should say, not just I believe, I know that what I am going to teach, preach, or whatever tonight, um, I know that it is essential in order for the church to continue to be the church and for it to move forward and for us to answer the call uh, to move up higher. Amen? How many wants to move up higher? Amen. Well, in order to do that, then this one subject that I'm going to uh, teach on tonight is, is going to be the backbone of that, uh, and that is prayer. Um, I think that for the next couple of Wednesdays, I'll kind of have different segments of this. It'll probably be a three-lesson three series on prayer, but tonight I'm going to be very simplistic with it. Um, I'm going to uh, really take for, for granted, I guess, not take for granted, but just have the assumption, I guess, that uh, all the fundamentals of the word prayer, we, we basically know and we understand, okay? So uh, some of the lesson tonight uh, isn't going to go into you know, maybe the nitty-gritty of the simplistic of it, right? But uh, it's going to basically steer us into understanding the essential need of prayer. The essential need of prayer. Amen? Second Chronicles chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 12 through 16. And it is a very, very familiar portion of Scripture. But I feel like this is a good way to approach the essential need of prayer. It says in verse 12, starting out, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. And the background music. <laughs> that came in pretty, pretty good. It was like, hey, here we go. We're getting into it right now. Right now. But in the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there will be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, here's a scripture we have heard plenty of times, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, everybody say and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes shall be open and mine ears attended unto the prayer that is made in this place a tent unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and thine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Just want to, again, talk to us on the essential need of prayer. You may be seated. 
Now, everybody has the basic idea and understanding of just what prayer is. This is a very familiar portion of Scripture, but a Scripture nonetheless that is able to encapsulate the subject of what prayer is, the subject of this message speaking on the necessity of having prayer in our lives. We all know what prayer is. I don't want to spend a lot of time again on the introduction to what prayer is, but I know that most of us, and I'm pretty sure I could say all of us, have experienced prayer at some level of commitment. But we usually have started out prayer for the very first time when we were a child and we found ourselves kneeling down at the side of the bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Anybody remember saying that prayer as a child? A simplistic prayer, an introductionary prayer, might I add. It's something that introduced us to the element of prayer at a very young age. Maybe it was around the dinner table prayer that uh, prayer was really kind of introduced as everyone waited patiently for the one blessing the food to be done so that they could finally dig in. And usually there's always that one person that forgot to wait for the prayer and their mouth is completely slammed full of food while they forgot to pray and they're waiting patiently so that they can chew it and swallow and enjoy the rest of what they have. But it's always the prayer, right? There are some people around the dinner table that seem to have a little sermonette as everybody is really hungry and really wanting to, to, to get down to business. But, you know, that one person felt like they had a sermon on their heart and you're just waiting patiently for them to shut up so that you can eat the food. We've all been there. We all know what that's like. But maybe prayer was introduced to you when you were going through something terrible in life that you had nothing else to try. You had nowhere else to go but to God. And so maybe the first time that you were sincerely introduced to the element of prayer was when your back was against the wall and you didn't know what else to do. So you tried something that you never tried before and you tried prayer. Or maybe, just maybe, the first time that you really prayed was at an old-fashioned altar that you first called out the name of the Lord. But regardless, we have all been introduced to an element of prayer at some point of time in our life. But the definition of prayer, the most basic definition of prayer is talking to God. Prayer is not meditation and it's not passive reflection. It is a direct address to God. It is the communication of the human soul with the Lord who created the soul. Prayer is the primary way for the believer to communicate his emotions and his desires with God and to have divine fellowship with the Creator. That's the basic definition of what prayer is. And for, I would say, all of us here, we all know what the basic definition already was. Martin Luther said it like this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Mrs. Van Zett said it like this, in my deepest, darkest moments, what really got me through was a prayer. Sometimes my prayer was, help me. Sometimes a prayer was, thank you. What I've discovered is, that intimate connection and communication with my creator will always get me through because I know my support and my help is but a prayer away. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, 
True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is spiritual tr uh, transaction, a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and of earth. George Herbert said it, prayer should be the key of the day and it should be the lock of the night. Boy, I think that is a spectacular way of summing that up. Prayer is the communication that you have with God that bridges that void in your life to form a relationship with the great creator. There is nothing like the element of prayer. There is nothing in your life that can ever come close to being able to entertain the presence of God by calling out his name in prayer. There is nothing that can save a soul except somebody to initiate a form of prayer by communicating with God. There is no way that you can receive your healing if you do not initiate a response, a call of the need in your life with some kind of response to God in prayer. There is no way that you can ever see God bless your family, bless your finances, bless your situation, or heal your mental dysfunction in life by the anxiety of this, of this world, by, by, by the things that bring the stresses and the pressures and the vices that seem to just consume your life and your way of thinking every day. And there's nothing that can take care of those elements and of those things or those items if you do not initiate some form of prayer by communicating to God. It's impossible. In, you cannot receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with your mouth shut. It is impossible. You cannot be forgiven of your sins when you come up if you refuse to call out the name of Jesus it is impossible. You cannot expect God to bless you, to anoint you, to entertain the worship unless you open up your mouth and give him some form or element of communication. Communication with God is a must. I, I, I think I've quoted this numerous amounts of times, but in the very beginning, let them make me a tabernacle that I might dwell among them because God wanted to be in the presence of the people so the people could be in the presence of God. But there needed to be a form and an element of communication. And that is what we know to be prayer. Without communication, without communicating to God, Listen to me. There can be no relationship with God. Simple I know, pretty elementary I know, but how true it is. But there are too many people that feel that they have a, that they have a relationship with God because they are obedient in some form or fashion or area in their life. So they feel like that substitutes a relationship with God without the communication side of it. An approach like that is what old timers would say, you're placing the cart in front of the horse. Meaning that obedience is good. Obedience is a must. It is essential. But it is only by prayer that the relationship can ever be formed between you and God. And that relationship should be the pulling force for our obedience to be seen, not the other way around. We can expect to do X, Y, and Z and say that that's making me have a relationship with God. If you are not communicating to God, if there is no prayers that are going up to Him, do not fool yourself into thinking that you have a relationship with Him. There's, I'm telling you, there's too many people that justify their walk with God, that it's good, that it, the, the status is all right because they're doing X, Y, and Z, but yet they don't have a prayer life. And if you don't have a prayer life, then you do not have a relationship with God. 
Simple as that. No prayer life, no communication. No communication with God, no relationship. No relationship. Examples. We can be consistent with your church attendance, but if there is no personal prayer life, it means nothing. You can sing and you can worship your heart out, but if there is no personal prayer life, then that means nothing. You can play your instrument until the keys fall off or, or, or the guitar strings seem to pop, if that's what you call them, or strung or break or whatever it is, or until the snare drum gets wore out. You can play and play and play, and you can say you're playing it unto God. But if there is no prayer life, then your relationship with God does not exist. You need a prayer life in order to have a relationship. You can be a part of a dynamic service. You can be a part of anointed preaching. You can be a part of a mighty realm of worship. But if you personally do not have a prayer life, then none of that matters to you. It means nothing because you've got to have a relationship with God. You've got to have a prayer life with him. If we're ever going to move forward, we've got to push and we've got to stress over and over and over again the importance of prayer. With little prayer, there's little power. With much prayer, there is much power. We need to be a church that is built with the foundation being a people of prayer. We are communicating to God. We're relating to Him because He's relating to us. We're trying to understand more and more and more there is to know about God. We are developing a relationship with Him because our communication is there. And we call it prayer. What's that old Jesus on the main line? Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Then the other part says, call him up, call him up. Tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up. Tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line now. Amen. Remember that old song? My goodness, there's so much meaning in the simplistic song. That we need to call him up, call him up, tell him what we want, tell him what we want. We need to have that open communication, that open line with God. When we get up in the morning, God, here I am. God, I'm thankful for everything you've done. God, protect me, protect my family. Lord, let my day start out right. In the afternoon, let there be a prayer on your tongue. When you go to bed, be meditating in a life of prayer. Your life should have the pattern of prayer and communication with God. Doesn't mean that you've got to be travailing all the time. Doesn't mean that you've got to be up here hugging the altar and slamming your fist down on it, being like, God, oh God, oh God. No. It's just having a communication with Him, it's just talking with Him. Just like you would pull up a chair and talk to somebody. That's the communication that God's desiring. Hey, listen, there's a time to travail and there's a time for a need and there's a time to get desperate. And I'll be right here beside you, probably slapping the altar with you. But I'm telling you what, you have to have a developed form in life of prayer. And that is with a consistent level of communication with God. You've got to keep communicating with God. You've got to keep communicating with God. All through the day. My goodness, just say a little prayer, sing a little song, hum a little music. Whatever it is, some form of prayer, God, I'm keeping this line open. I don't know when I might need you, but when I do, I know that you're right here with me already because there's a spirit and a presence of prayer in everything that I do. Whatever I set my mind to, whatever, wherever I go, wherever my feet place, I want to make sure that it's anointed with a spirit and a presence of prayer. But don't misunderstand me. What you contribute by the way of time, money, attendance, and help is essential and it will benefit the kingdom whether you have a relationship with God or not. But what I am trying to help you understand here tonight with the help of the Lord is that without a prayer life, there is no relationship with God and is what the Bible compares one of being as a well 
without water. 2 Peter 2.17 says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, uh, to whom the mist of the darkness is reserved forever. Wells without water. Without a personal relationship with God, you are not only lacking His presence, but you are living without fulfilling the purpose of why God created you in the first place. Genesis 2, 15 through 17 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The garden that was placed in Eden was a place of fellowship between God and Adam. The relationship that was developed was only formed, was only established by a consistent communication between Adam and God. One may ask, how do I start a relationship with God. Maybe you feel like you just haven't really had a good start in your relationship with God. Or maybe you feel like I just don't know what to do or how to start a relationship with God. But how do you develop a relationship with your spouse? Ask yourself that. How did you develop a relationship with your spouse? Because it is the same fundamental structure on how to develop a relationship with God. My wife and I started texting, and we would text throughout the day. And I believe I kind of alluded to this kind of scenario before, but we would text and we would text. And, and you know, it's one of those things to where you would text periodically. And, and, but when you heard the ding on your phone, boy, you, you about killed yourself trying to find your phone to see what that other person on the other line was saying, especially one that you're fond of, right? And so I would anticipate to hear that alarm, that, that certain tweet or ding or whatever your phone does. And uh, it, it brought a, a realm of excitement inside. You know, I was anticipating listening for that ding. And, 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 and when it did, boy, I tell you what, I would hurry and race and, and then I would go and then I would, I would text back and I would wait. And I would wait, and I'm thinking, okay, why isn't she texting me back yet? But the anticipation was there because I was fond of her. And, and I'm thinking, if she's really fond of me, she would have responded by now. <laughs> you know, all these things go through your head. Why hasn't she responded yet? Well, maybe she's busy, Josh. Maybe, maybe she's got something going on. She was working in the hospital and in my mind, I'm thinking, ain't nobody matter except for me. You should be responding to me right now if you really love me. Well, it wasn't love at the time. If you really are fond of me and, and everything like that. But it was just kind of one of those things to where it's kind of like I am anticipating on a reply. Amen. But the more we started to kind of build that texting relationship and the more that time went on, and the more that we began to know more and more about each other, you know, the more texting we did. And then there came a day when it just seemed like texting each other just wasn't cutting it. So it got to the point that I wanted to hear her voice. So I picked up the phone and I called her. You talk about somebody's nerves who were wrecked. My nerves were wrecked. Because I'm thinking, we are going from texting to an actual phone call. A vocal conversation between each other. To where she might not like me if she talks to me in person. You know, because you can read a text a thousand different ways. But when you talk to somebody, that's when it's like. But so I thought, you know what? I'm going to give her a call. So I did. And then when I called her once, it was easy to call her again. And then when I called her again, then it was easier to call her the next time. The more the relationship continued to grow, the more I had, I had to have a, a conversation with her. I had to talk to her. The more the relationship developed, the more that I had to get her on the other line so that I could hear her voice. 
When the relationship was established, it moved past periodically calling a couple days out of the week to now calling every single day. But then soon calling once a day turned into calling multiple times throughout that day. You see where I'm going with this? It it didn't go backwards because I was fond of her. I wanted to build a relationship with her. So what seemed to go out as something, what started out as something so small that you thought, how can you ever build a relationship with just texting each other? Well, that was the starting point. But that was not the end point. Because the more I talked to her, the more that I had to talk to her. You see what I'm saying? We have to understand that this concept applies with our prayer life too. A perfect example is when the Bible tells of two men that were walking on the road to Emmaus after the news, fresh off the press that Jesus was resurrected, that he was risen, and that the tomb was empty and the body of Jesus was now missing. Fresh news, right off the press, happened on that specific day. And here you have two men walking on the road to Emmaus, already hearing this news, but they were a little skeptical The two men hearing the excitement of the ladies that just received the confirmation by the two angels at the tomb that Jesus is risen. He's no longer here. To these two men, it was just a realm of wishful thinking. It was just something that they were hoping for, but didn't quite believe it. They just didn't receive it like the ladies at the tomb did. And one of those ladies was the man's wife. And he's probably thinking, honey, you've done lost it. You've fallen off your rocker. There is no way, as much as we want Jesus to be risen, as much as we don't want him to be there, and as much as I want to be persuaded that you actually saw some angels (laughs) there at the tomb saying he's not here for he is alive, as much as I want to, I I I just don't know if I can. I want that to be true, but I'm not sure if I believe it just yet. But lo and behold, Jesus accompanies these two men along the journey. All the while, these two men did not realize that it was Jesus Christ himself, the resurrected Savior. Jesus journeyed with them. He spoke to these men. He had a conversation with these men. He reminded them of scripture. And the Bible says that that Jesus even stayed with these two men and even sat down and had dinner with these guys. And he conversated with them. And And he had some fellowship with them. And when Jesus broke the bread and spoke scriptures to them, the Bible says that their eyes were open and Jesus vanished from their sights. These men knew of his teachings. They witnessed the miracles and followed the life of Jesus because they felt, as recorded in Luke 24, 21, it says that they felt that Jesus was the Savior, the Messiah. They believed that Jesus that was crucified was the Messiah, the promised Messiah of old. They believed that. When Jesus broke bread, their eyes were illuminated. They they, they started putting the pieces together. And so when Jesus vanished, their response was accompanied with a flood of emotions and an earnest, long-awaited relief of happiness. The words Jesus spoke to them were coming from the very one that they longed to be with, that they hoped that they would see again, the one that they had all of their time invested in. The one who forever changed their life with a personal relationship that was established with them while he walked among them. These were followers of Christ. These were not disciples, but they were followers of Christ. They developed a relationship with Jesus along the way. They had a relationship with him. Their response summed it all up by saying, In Luke 24, 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? I am sure that these two men had an instant walk 
down memory lane, reminiscing on the first time that they actually heard the scriptures of old being read in the temple when Jesus himself confirmed that he was the Messiah. Those memories started flooding back. But soon that wasn't enough for them to just hear the scriptures being read at the beginning. But they had to know more of the one who was fulfilling the prophetic scriptures right before their very eyes. They had to know more of who he was. But soon that wasn't even enough. They then invested to him their absolute entire lives so they could communicate with Jesus every single day and throughout the day because just a little bit of Jesus was not going to do it. They needed as much Jesus in their life as possible. They needed to have a close relationship with God. It was only by their established relationship with Jesus that they could say, did not our hearts burn within us? It was because of that close relationship, that connection with Jesus that they could say that. Did not our heart burn within us? I'm talking to us about the essential need of prayer. We've got to be a people of prayer. You cannot depend on the pastor to do the praying for you and then wonder why you do not have a close relationship with God. You can't go to brother, sister, or so-and-so and and say, I know you're a prayer warrior. Can you develop a relationship with God for me so that I don't have to? It doesn't work that way. You personally have to develop a relationship with God. Just like the two men on the road to Emmaus, it all started by hearing the words of Jesus. Then it turned into a desire to know more of Jesus. Then it turned into a desire to know more and more of Jesus. Then it became something that they could not live without. And the only way that they could describe it was like the prophet of old described it when Jeremiah said in 20, verse 9 of Jeremiah, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. The Christian Standard Bible says it like this. But his message became a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones. I became tired of holding it in. I cannot prevail. You wonder where you can start with prayer. It's by just simply calling out the name of Jesus and having a conversation with him. You might say, well, I'm never going to be like so-and-so. Why? Why not? Just because you're starting at prayer and you're starting to build a relationship in a communication with prayer to God doesn't mean that you're going to pray like somebody who's been praying for 20 or 30 years. Don't defeat yourself just because you can't hear yourself praying like some other people. That has nothing to do with it. Your prayer is just as powerful as the next person's prayer. It's all on your commitment. It's all on how your relationship with God is developed. It's all on how much you earnestly mean everything that you're saying. Amen? It's just like the whole text thing. You start out with prayer and it seems little. But the more that you pray, the more that you'll want to pray. And pretty soon... Praying this prayer and praying that prayer is just not going to cut it anymore. And and you want to go deeper. So then all of a sudden you start going deeper in your prayer life with God. And and it gets longer and it gets more intense. and, And pretty soon you find yourself still unsatisfied. So every time that the presence of God starts moving, you're you're expressing this communication in your worship. You're expressing it in absolutely everything you do. Because now. You have been consumed with prayer. You've got to hear from God. You've got to talk to God. You've got to have a communication line with God. You've got to have that spirit of prayer. So now everything that you do in life represents a person who has a divine walk and relationship with God. Everything you do, how you talk, how you live, how you walk, what what decisions you decide to make, 
Everything is constituted now because you have a relationship with God because that communication started at some point in your life. You've got to have a prayer life with God. This is what I'm trying to instill into us tonight is you need to have a prayer life with God. It is absolutely essential. Without it, no one will have a relationship with God. You know, if you don't know somebody, you can't go to bat for somebody. A lot of times people will be like, well, how come you didn't stand up for that person? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that person. I, I have no idea. I don't know the facts. I, I have no clue. I'm, I'm not really sure. They're on their own, I guess. I, I mean, I can't stand up for somebody that I don't know. But the more that you have a relationship with God, the more you open up his word, the more you know about him, the more your desire to be with him will grow. The more that you'll desire and long to be in his presence. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. There's fullness of joy. Amen? There's that type of relationship that you'll have with God and, and you'll be able to communicate with him and you'll understand more about him. You'll understand what he can do for you and you'll have a, a new dynamic or approach in your prayer life with God as it grows. You can only have a relationship with God if you communicate, if you conversate, if you talk to him. It doesn't have to be profound. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be thought out and it does not have to be perfect. And let me go a step further. It doesn't matter where you're at in life, what you have done or where you feel you're going. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. It starts by coming to Jesus and desiring to have a relationship with him. A lot of people be like, well, how's come this person doesn't worship? And how's come that person doesn't worship? And how's come they sit there on their pew like a statue? Well, I'll be honest with you, and I can answer that for you. They don't have a prayer life. If you don't have a prayer life, you cannot hide it. If you do not have a relationship with God, everything you do, including your worship, is not going to fool anybody. You can sit there frozen and like a statue. But if you have a prayer life, if you've been talking to God, if the communication line is open, then you will understand the goodness of God and what he's done for you and how he's working things out in your life and how he sets you free and the blessings that he's pouring out and the protection that he has over your children and how the, how the prayers are being answered and the testimonies are being created. You will know all of that stuff and you cannot sit in your seat like a statue because you have nothing else to do but to give him praise for what he's doing in your life. And you give him praise because you have a relationship with him and he has a relationship with you. That's the type of prayer that needs to be developed in us. If you don't have that type of prayer to where when you come to church and you don't feel the need to worship and you don't feel the need to give him thanks, then you might want to examine your prayer life because you don't know the God that I know because the God that I know has done so much for me that I can't even begin to tell it all. The God that I know won't allow me to stay seated because when I think of his goodness, the God that I know, I can't just keep there with my hands in my pocket just hoping and, and watching everybody else get their blessing. No, I know he's blessed me before. I know he wants to bless me again. I'm going to walk in his promises. I'm going to be the apostolic church in the book of Acts. I'm going to walk in his blessing, in his presence, in his anointing. And the only way that I can do that is if I have a relationship with God. You've got to have a relationship with God. You have to. But you are not to stay at the level of I lay me down to sleep type of prayer. That is not where your prayer life should stay. It's cute and it's good for an introductory prayer. But you have to develop and mature your walk with God. The more that you pray and communicate with God, the more that unction of the Holy Ghost inside of you is going to take you to your knees. 
It's going to make you travail for the needs and for people and for problems that you're not even aware of. That's how powerful prayer is. And I'll get into that in another lesson. But I'm telling you that there is power when you have a connection and a relationship with God. I want to have the mind of God. I want to think of the things that are godly, that are holy, that are pure, that are of a good report. And the only way that I can do that is if I have a relationship with my father. The more and more that my wife and I started talking, the more and more we started thinking alike and talking alike and finishing each other's sentences and and, and, and everything like that. And, And, you know, the crazy part is that sometimes even the taste of food just kind of changed a little bit because they like it and now all of a sudden you like it and you never liked it but now you do like it right but it's like with God there's some things that you just disagreed with and you said I will never do but then God got a hold of your life you developed a relationship with him and now you're dancing in the aisle jumping up and down and taking a lap because he's done so much for you Your eyes are open, your mind's illuminated, and now God sets you free because he's transformed your life into a living sacrifice now. And and now you're all his, you're all in. What started with a little commitment when I came up to the altar, now I'm all in. I am dedicated. I am consecrated now. Now I'm driven to prayer. I've got to pray. I have to pray. I can't go a day without prayer. My life has to reflect a a, a, a presence presence of a prayer. I've got to be consumed with this thing. I've got to be consumed with it. Praise God. The more you pray and build a relationship with God, there should be that inward desire that goes from I have to pray to I can't wait to pray. I can't wait to get into his presence. That's the problem sometimes when we come to church is we feel like we have to. Boy, I'm telling you what, if we would just kind of adjust that mindset a little bit and be like, boy, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in church today. I can't wait to see what he's going to do in a Sunday evening service. I can't wait to see what he's going to do in a Bible study. I can't wait to hear what my kids learned in Sunday school class and And God, I'm praying that you just move in a Sunday school class and that my kid, my child, receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost back in a Sunday school class. I pray, Lord, that you impart something into them. I pray you speak to them even at a young age. That's my prayers. And guess what? God hears the prayers of his people. I'm not praying to somebody that's not hearing me. I'm not praying to somebody that's not that's just turning a deaf ear to me. No, he's listening to everything that I'm saying. Everything that I'm lifting up to him is like a sweet es- uh, incense uh, into his nostrils. So when I say protect my children, guess what? He's going to protect my children. God moved back in the classrooms. He's going to move back in the classrooms. That's having a spirit in a presence of prayer. The communication line's always open. Boy, I'd hate to be behind the wheel of a car and not have a prayer life when the semi's coming head on. But if you're always meditating upon God and you have a presence of prayer in your life, you ain't going to think twice. The first thing out of your mouth is, help me, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Why? Because Jesus has consumed you by the relationship that you've developed with him. 2 Chronicles 7.14 And let me say this too, your your prayer life should never have set restrictions. You shouldn't come to prayer being like, Lord, thank you, Jesus. I got five minutes to fill in. Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you're just watching the clock to get your time in, that means nothing. And if all you're doing is moaning and moaning and not communicating to God, I'm I'm starting to question if God really understands the desires of your heart. Are you communicating with him? Are you talking to him? Hey, listen, there are times to where it seems like only there's this groaning within. There is a time for that. But you better have a good open dialogue with God. He better know where you're at, where you need help with. He wants to hear it out of your mouth. That's what a relationship is. If my wife came around and and I just had to assume I knew what she was saying, boy, that would be a miserable marriage. And I promise you, nine out of ten times, I would probably get it wrong. 
But I'm telling you that if we would communicate to each other, that relationship is going to be a little bit more harmonious. It's going to be a little bit more cultivating, right? We'll be able to build on something like that. You've got to talk to God. Talk to Him. Hallelujah. 2 Chronicles 7.14. It was the opening portion of Scripture. I thought this was a good way to kind of sum this up in closing. If my people, which are called by my name, stop. My people, called by my name. In order for there to be a solidified commitment, my wife and I can talk all day long. We can develop that relationship. But she is not going to take on my name until she's all in and there's some vows and commitment that are spoken. Jesus said, my people which are called by my name. Ask yourself, is the name of Jesus, uh, is the name of Jesus applied in your life? Can you say that you have taken on the name of Jesus. My people called by my name. There needs to be a commitment. You have to take on the name of Jesus. That is the result of a relationship with God. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. How deep is your relationship with God? Do you have a relationship with God? And if you're wondering how your relationship is with God, Ask yourself this question, how is my prayer life? Let's stand. Simplistic, I know. But I am telling you that we need to make sure that our prayer life is where it needs to be because you will not have a relationship that continues to grow if you do not have a prayer life with God. Psalm says it like this, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Praise God. Let's all just lift our hands. Let's call out the name of Jesus. And let's just demonstrate the prayer life that we have by calling out his name. By calling out to him like you would at the time that you spend with him in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I praise you for what you've done. I praise you for what you're doing. I praise you for what you're about to do. God, I love you. Thank you for giving me breath today. Thank you, Lord, for giving me health today. Thank you for keeping your hand upon me and my family and upon this church and upon the families of this church and upon the young people when they go to school. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for the service that we experienced this past Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you're revealing to us. And, and I'm thanking you, God, for the things in advance of what you're about to do in the city of Mount Vernon. I thank you, God. Lord, I pray that you would search me, O oh Lord, Search my heart, search my ways, search my mind, cleanse me, wash me. I pray, Lord, that you would create in me a clean heart. If I've done anything to offend you, I'm sorry. If I've messed up, I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me. If I should have done something that I didn't do, God, I pray that you would forgive me, but that you would allow me to see what I need to start doing. God, help me in everything that I do. Let me be the light that I should be, that you intended for me to be. Let your word be hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let it be, Lord, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I pray, Lord, that this church is a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. I pray, Lord, that you would just keep your hand upon our children and upon our family. God, I plead the blood upon our young people. I plead the blood upon the Sunday school. 
school classes. Uh, I plead the blood uh, upon the, uh, uh, the seniors and, and, and the elderly and those that need a healing and those that need deliverance and those that are struggling with anxiety and depression. I come against it in the name of Jesus. Uh, I come against it in the only saving name and the only healing name and the only delivering name and that is in the name of Jesus. Uh, in everything I do, I pray that I do it to the best of my ability. But I pray in everything I do, I pray people see you shining through me. I pray, Lord, that everything that I do, everything I set my hand to, every, every place that I, I place my foot, I pray, Lord, that you would just make sure that my steps are ordered in your presence. Give me that direction. Uh, give me that wisdom. I pray that you would give me that clarity. Lord, I pray for fresh revelation. I pray for fresh understanding. I pray that you would illuminate your word. Show me things that I've never seen before. Show me things, Lord, that I've never even thought of before. I pray, Lord, that my walk with you grows deeper. I pray my heart, Lord, pants for you like a deer pants beside the water brook that David said. I pray, Lord, that I would just be so encapsulated with your presence. I pray there would be a desire that's birthed, that's formed, that I've got to be in your presence, that I have to be in your presence. God, when I come to church, if I don't feel like worshiping, I pray, God, I worship you anyway because you deserve it. If I'm tired, I pray you give me the strength just to make it to church and just to be the person and the man that I ought to be. Let me be the man of the house. Let me represent Christ in everything I do. I pray that you're the center of my family. I pray that you're at the center of my job. I pray that you're at the center of everything that I set out to do. I pray, Lord, that I seek you and seek your face with everything that I have. Oh, as for me and my house, let us serve you. As for me and my house, let us praise you. As for me and my house, let us be dedicated. Let us be consecrated. Let us be faithful to the house of God. Let us pray without ceasing. Let us believe on the miracles, the signs and the wonders that you said that we are going to experience. Let us walk in the apostolic faith, in the book of Acts mentality. God, that you're getting ready to open up the heavens and pour out such a blessing and outpouring on the city of Mount Vernon and upon this church for the renewing of our mind by the refreshing of this city and that there would be a great revival that sweeps not only here but into the counties that are surrounding us. Oh God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Oh Lord, let me enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. I will sing when I don't feel like singing. I am going to shout when I don't feel like shouting and I'm going to pray when I don't feel like praying. God, in everything I do, I pray, Lord, that I do it with everything that I've got for your glory, not for me. It's not about me, it's about you. It's not about me, it's about you. Oh God, let us have the spirit of prayer. Let us, Lord, have that spirit of prayer. Let us develop a walk, a deeper walk. Lord, take us to new levels and new heights. Let us grow spiritually, God. Let our prayer lives be so dynamic. Draw us to pray for other people. Let us have faith when we pray that you are faithful and just to do just what you said you would do. Oh, Lord, you are able to do an exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. There is no hesitation with me there, God. I know you're able to do it. I know you're going to do it. And if your word said that you're going to accomplish it, then my faith rests in you. My faith rests in you and I know that you are more than able, more than capable and more than willing to do exactly what you said you would do. Oh, in the precious, powerful, magnificent name, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Oh, the Rose of Sharon, the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Let's just pray. Pray just a little bit longer. Let's just vast in his presence just a little bit longer. It's amazing what happens when you start entertaining his presence. God starts entertaining yours. Oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, you have called us to be a people of prayer. You have called us to go deeper. You have called us to new heights. You have called us, Lord, to look up and to elevate, Lord, our expectations. And we are answering that, but we are answering it with prayer. Grow, Lord, a relationship with us like we've never had. 
Speak to us like we've never been spoken to. Touch our lives like you've never touched it. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would feel you like we've never felt you. Um, in the name of Jesus, God, let us entertain your presence. Uh, let us vast in your presence. Uh, let us be sensitive to your presence, God. Uh, oh, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Uh, churches, prayer like this, when you just keep pushing and you keep pressing, there's some things that start to break. There's some walls that start to come down. There's some strongholds that start to disintegrate. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, in the name of the Lord, let there be a hedge of protection around our young people, God. I pray, Lord, that you would give them the strength to say no when they need to say no. I pray that you give them the strength to stand for righteousness, for holiness. I pray, Lord, that they hide the word in their heart, that when it comes time for the test to happen, Lord, that they shine, that they come forth as pure gold. I pray, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself to other people through our lives and how we walk and what we do. And how we live. Oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Church's prayers like that. Hallelujah. It's not profound. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be methodical. It doesn't have to be a deep essay, a vernacular, exoteric terminology of capricious philosophy. It doesn't have to be anything deep like that. It just has to be, God, here I am. God, I've got some needs I've got to bring to you. Lord, I've got some situations I need you to answer. Lord, can, you just, can, you, can I just talk to you just for a little bit? Can I just have your ear for just a little bit? Tell them about your problems. Tell them what's on your heart. Oh, praise God. Praise God. And when you demonstrate that kind of prayer life at home, when you demonstrate it at home, I promise you when you come to service, you will experience a service like Mount Vernon has never seen or experienced before because you are going to have the presence of prayer, a relationship, a God who is following behind you because wherever my wife goes, I want to make sure I protect her because I've developed that relationship. I've developed that relationship with her. I want to make sure that I take care of her and God loves you so much. That he wants to make sure he takes care of you and takes care of this church too. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor, give him a high five and say, be a person of prayer. Amen, amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.